Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. <clears throat> Thank you for joining our session. Um, my name is Yuri, uh, and I'm working as a DHS2 implementer in the HISP UIO in the core team. And a lot of work uh, is dedicated to uh, trackers and building the uh, metadata toolkits, the global uh, toolkits that you might be familiar with. <clears throat> and uh, today we will talk a little bit about good tracker design principles. Uh, I'm very nervous. Uh, <clears throat> is the microphone working? Yeah, that's okay. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Give the few more seconds for the guests to sit down. And just for those of you that are interested in Tracker, there will be another session here, I think, in the same auditorium afterwards on complex Tracker implementations. <clears throat> so we could talk about this for a long time. I hope you have enough time, but maybe we'll manage quite quickly and then you'll have some free time afterwards. Our main objectives is to look at the fundamental principles of uh, good tracker design in DHS2. So we're not starting with the question, tracker or not, we are already there. So let's, let's, let's do tracker. We're gonna look at some examples and uh, uh, we'll hear from the uh, representatives of the HISPs of how they managed uh to deal with these uh principles and hopefully we can facilitate some discussion this is the main objective here i put the uh image of a coffee cups uh on the main presentation uh, slide and i'll explain why it's, it's not obvious from the slide <clears throat> so when i first started learning to design tracker it was around five years ago. I'm sure there are people here that have way more experience than me in this. Uh, my first tracker was about how many coffee cups the uh, people in the company that I work drink every day. And there was one stage that I created after enrolling them in the in this tracker. And then I thought, oh, it's, it's a bit boring. It doesn't give me much. I'll have add another stage on how happy they are at the end of the day or how sad they are at the end of the day. And then I started learning about program indicators and I thought, okay, how can I then maybe, you know, analyze whether the amount of coffee they drink makes them happy or not, or it has no effect on them. And that's when it fell on me that, oh, I should have not created it as a separate stage. I should have just added it to the, to the first one because then it would be easier for, the, for me to calculate it. So this is a little bit of an intro. We'll get to the slides where I think the choices and design of your program stages and uh, and the program structure will, you know, may affect how the tracker will work. So we'll look at into that later. And uh, <clears throat> so just uh, in general, so what are the DHS2 tracker programs there? many use cases, a, a, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, ministries, organizations, individuals use trackers. So these can be the patient registries. We're dealing with a lot of surveillance programs. Uh, we're now learning more about using tracker for event-based surveillance. And this is where your mind explodes because we're familiar with event programs. We're familiar with trackers. But enrolling an event into a tracker already blows a fuse. So uh, we do work with program monitoring and evaluation, uh, case management, health service deliveries, surveys. It's probably the easiest ones to introduce because once you filled in the questionnaire, that's it. Uh, supply chains, logistics, outbreak responses, community health programs. And those circles there, they're not just for decoration. As you can see that uh, there's always a question that comes up, you know, what's a 
tracker? Can it be an EMR or can it be a registry or what is it, a survey? And I think that displays a little bit that there's always an overlap between these programs uh, and it's how you design it and what it's meant to do that's going to be uh, the, the you know, in, in your use case, how you're going to use it. <clears throat> uh, what is a tracker uh, in DHS2? Here I just summarized a few concepts that we are all on the same page. Uh, we are looking at the individual level data collection, right? So the tracker programs, they collect data on a specific entity. It does not have to be an individual. It can be a case, it can be an object, it can be anything. Uh, and But the tracker they in includes the entity identifiers and then all the program related information uh, in a specific, in a, a DHS2 data model, in the in a tracker data model. Uh, tracker programs allow longitudinal tracking. So they track data over time and then allow for the monitoring of trajectories, progress and outcomes. Uh, tracker consists of programs and stage stages. So a tracker does not have to be one program. It can be several programs covering one area. Uh, and a tracker program can have stages. So or specific events within the program that can be either one off or repeated, uh, repeatable, and they enable detailed monitoring of different interventions. <clears throat> tracker allows you to build customizable forms and fields uh, that can be tailored to specific programs. Uh, there's data validation and quality control built into Tracker or not un unless you build it. Um, and Tracker allows reporting and anal analysis. So they provide tools for generating reports and analyzing, uh, analyzing data to inform interventions and uh, policy decisions. So this is where we are. <clears throat> And uh, I think the, the good principles of tracker design can be put into those key focus areas that I have summarized here. And again, not a self-explanatory image right here, but it's rather a quote, you know, what I'm doing here, again, we, we, we can talk forever, but I'm just throwing a spear into the forest and let's see what comes out of it, you know. We may all benefit from it or we will fail. So, but the focus areas here are the initial, the, the assessment and the stakeholder engagement. Uh, then it's the user-centric design and the grayed out areas are also there, but we're just not gonna cover them today because again, we'll stay here uh, until the night. It doesn't get dark, but the, no. <clears throat> Yeah, data quality, uh, flexibility and scalability of your tracker programs, the data security and privacy, integration, performance, data monitoring, data analysis, usability testing, and sustainability. Uh, and a lot of decisions that we make when we design tracker, they, they don't fall under one area. They can cover several at the, at the same time. But these are the ones that we kind of need to keep in mind that we need to work with when we uh, uh, design trackers. The presentation will be available for you uh, in the conference folder. So don't worry about it. But if you want to take photos, please do. Um, so we will go through these areas and I will ask some uh, guest speakers just to give some ideas on how they've dealt with the uh, with these questions when they set up trackers. Uh, not theoretical like I do, but real implementations. <clears throat> and yes, let's see where we get. And then we'll have uh, time for discussion and questions. So let's look at uh, uh, assessment and uh, stakeholder engagement. I think one of the most important Area. So the, the beginning is that we need to conduct thorough assessments to understand the specific needs and uh, of the tracker program we are going to implement. We need to identify key indicators and outcomes that we want. Uh, 
we also need to engage the stakeholders and not only at the top we need to go all the way down to the uh you know to health workers to uh people who will enter the data uh, and get their input um we need to speak to program managers policy makers from the outset so that our requirements will make sure that the program will meet their needs and here there are that the diagram shows the balance that you need to reach when you when you work with with the assessment and engagement is you know you um the analytic outputs there might be hundreds of indicators that you need to create for very few stakeholders uh but then at the same time you want a structured workflow uh to make sure that you know there's logic be behind the tracker uh the the data entry forms and you want a streamlined user experience for the end user so that means the less data you need to enter, the better it is. And so as a designer, you need to kind of balance between these three to make sure that your product uh, is uh, of good quality. <clears throat> and uh, before I um, continue with uh, the examples from the HIST groups, I will give you my uh, example from, from an implementation we're working with uh, that where this did not go so well. Uh, and we, we, we started talking with, uh, with an organization in a country to introduce a tracker, but they did not engage all the stakeholders uh, into the process. And so they kind of took our generic package and said, this is great, this is what we need they've translated it they've adopted it uh they kind of sold it to the stakeholders without explaining what it was uh, and when we started working with the with the ministry and when with the real stakeholders we understood that their outputs or their indicators were not what this package was there to deliver and i think it slowed down the process for about a year uh with a lot of disappointment, with a lot of uh, attention. So initial assessment and stakeholder engagement is vital at this stage. And uh, I think when, when you work with on these programs, that, that's what you should really start with. And here I would uh, uh, just uh, ask some guests that, you know, I'm not going to call out anyone from the audience. It's all prepared. They practice. They practice. But uh, uh, I'll ask uh, Adnan uh, Bashir from uh, his Pakistan to share some of his experience or of the experience of his Pakistan and their work on how they've engaged with stakeholders and its assessments uh, when working on trackers. Uh, so can you hear me all? Yeah, okay, perfect. So, um, I mean, yes, Yuri gave an example of uh, using a WHO package uh, right away without proper assessment. Uh, in Pakistan, uh, we did use a WHO package. Uh, it's uh, for TB. Uh, so we have the largest, one of the largest uh, TB uh, tracker implementation in, uh, in all of the world. Uh, it combines uh, not only the public side, but also the private side. So. Uh, this assessment of stakeholder uh, assessment and the stakeholder engagement it's it's very very crucial uh, the reason is that you need to understand the country context you need to understand the who packages are very good i mean they come in pre-installed with a lot of configuration that you you don't have to do again you don't have to redo uh, but again it's very important that uh, we do the assessment we do the country context we we should understand the country context that what uh, data flows they are following. So we had to change a lot of things um, after uh, we installed that WHO package. We had to combine the private and public workflows in one tracker. So a lot of changes were there. But the good thing of using WHO packages were that we had those, those uh, naming conventions, 
those uh, pre-configured indicators there. So we utilize them as well, but at the same time, we configured and reached and changed the overall structure of the tracker. Um, just to give you an example, um, WHO packages has around 10 TB tests. Pakistan only conducts four of them. So we had to remove all the extra TB uh, tests from the uh, from the configuration so that we our WHO our country context is visible for them. So I guess yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and I don't know, Alejandro, is it is it easy if the speakers come here and use this microphone? No, it doesn't matter. Okay. I think also. Um, uh, Mohammed, uh, from his main had uh, something to say, and he has actually prepared a slide. I will let me share it here. So, can you hear me well? Okay, so, um, user design, or uh, when it comes to the design any healthcare system, the first thing that we have to have early buy in, we have to consult our uh, direct client or our direct beneficiary, the Ministry of Health, not only the Ministry of Health, the ICT de department, we are talking about the health department, the real users of the system, they should be involved. As you see here, this is an iceberg. Okay, most of the people just focus on, we have two words, design and implementation of electronic systems. So people focus on implementation of DHIS2. We need to implement. No, that's totally wrong. We need to design, then implement. So the design, this is 70, 80% of this iceberg. And this is really come from our real experience of implementing the DHIS2 in 400 clinics in Palestine. And for time being, I'm in charge of implementing the DHIS2 in the MENA region for Arab uh, countries in the region. So. This 80% of the efforts, all of these efforts are devoted and dedicated for the, uh, for the design issue, to involve them, to listen for them, to get the requirement in written, and to use the storytelling. Okay, give me your story. How is the data workflow? How is the, ser the service within the clinics? All these issues, when you look for the user's involvement and the sensitization meeting, the first line and the bottom line, if you spend good time on this, you can implement the DHIS2. But before that, the design part, then the implementation. So in the design, we can listen and we can hear more, we can write, we can validate what we hear from them and return back with them. Then we can reach to the more acceptability. So the acceptability or the user acceptance comes from the uh, proper design. We can maybe talk about just one example, if, if the time, about the, for example, the design of interoperability. All Ministry of Health, when they ask, we need the integration and interoperability. What is the answer for that? Give me a concrete business case. What you need to, to integrate? What is the minimum data set should be integrated or exchange or interchange between two different systems? Because it's a big word, big term, when you say interoperability and integration. But when it comes to the reality, you will find it's just like the demographic data, just a few data to be replicated into the system. So it's very clear, simple, specific, direct use case and simple case. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, move to the next slide. Uh, and we're still with the uh, assessment and stakeholder engagement. And uh, th this very complex slide on implementation considerations, we're not going to, going to talk about these considerations as such, but I, I just kept this slide here because the uh, your design might be dependent on these considerations uh, when when you you work with a tracker. So, for uh, as an example, <clears throat> uh, how will the DHS two tools be managed uh, in the uh, within the country's HMIS? So you you have tracker instances and aggregate instances working at the same time, then th that will impact your design. 
uh, what is the in-country digitization maturity? So if you're using Tracker everywhere or you're using Tracker and aggregate data sets at the same time, that will be part of your consideration how to design the, the Tracker for that, for that use case. Uh, what is the existing data flow? You have paper uh, registers, you have electronic uh, registers or mixed model. And how will you incorporate that or combine that in the in the tracker, and what will the tracker replace? So that that's another question because when you introduce something, a tool like a tracker, you, you know you don't want to add up the load to the to the workers. You want to actually make their life uh, easier. Uh, and then, at what level is the reporting going to take place? You know, at the facility, at the district. This will. Uh, impact your the outputs that you will create the 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 indicators dashboards and and so on uh very important questions what is your data entry going to be like are you de are you dealing with the secondary data entry inputting things from excel documents registries paper or is it going to be real time or is it going to be a transition process that has to be incorporated and I'll, I'll give you an example uh, of that now. We, <clears throat> we are working with uh, uh, in, uh, incorporating uh, lab data into the, into the tracker. But uh, because the country is not ready to give access to DHS2 to, to all the laboratories that are in the country, uh, at this stage, we had to consider and adding the you know just simple data elements to flag those labs where where the tests are being analyzed but in the future we want to make sure that when this integration with the lab will take place that the events in the tracker will be registered there where the uh, labs are uh, where, where the tests are being processed and so on so <clears throat> uh, devices that are, will be used in the implementation can have an effect on how you design your data entry, uh, where there's going to be mobile uh, stations moving around, health facility workers, and so on, or whether they're going to be using computers. Uh, the types of user groups that you will create, okay, how will you define access to your program stages within the tracker? Do you want to give a certain group access to only one stage and nothing else? you will have to think about it when you set up the metadata. How the organization unit structure will look <clears throat> in your tracker implementation. Will you be dealing with uh, creating a lot of organization unit groups to <laughs> enable some things? That, that, that's something that uh, has to be taken, take, taken care of. And uh, of course, the, the adaptation of I mean that's where that's where we are at, at this stage. So, um, and this kind of buy-in, what Mohammed was referring to, and this uh, the stakeholder engage, engagement, it does not happen once. I think so. So here you have the implementation life cycle. Once you've kind of designed the package and you planned and you gathered requirements and then you designed and then you've tested, you've prepared the deployment, you start. And only then you will get to the beginning where you might want to plan a scale up or extension of the package or improvement. So this will be going on uh, for, 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 for the life cycle of the program, I would say. Uh, so <clears throat> Mohammed uh, mentioned something on the, on the user-centric design. So here, the main principles to think about are, you know, that the design and the of the interface and the workflows have to be as simple and intuitive as possible. Okay, and uh, we will get to this a little bit later in, in the text, but I would say here that sometimes we think, why can't we just translate the paper form that we have and then use it in the tracker? If it's a survey, maybe that will be the best thing you do, or if it's a questionnaire, but if you're thinking about the long, uh, longitudinal program, like, I don't know, TB, HIV, whatever, that will definitely be not the right way to do so because you're gonna be replacing the paper forms with new digital workflow and 
uh, you will have to train your users to get used to them. You have to make sure that the system is still user friendly and uh, encourage the adoption for you. <clears throat> you um, have to think of localization requirements. Okay, will you use will you be using one language? Will it be multilingual? And how are you going to deal with that? Uh, maybe it's a uh, cultural context uh, that you have to think of when you adopt the package or design it. Uh, that has to be taken into account. Uh, and yeah, you know, what I already said is that the you know make guided decisions when translating any paper forms. Uh, the, the, to be included in the tracker, uh, does it make sense? Even though the paper looks so simple, you might want to separate uh, some of the uh, uh, some of the metadata. A good example is, uh, let's say, uh, in the program they want to have the status of the uh, I don't know HIV. Uh, and you would put it into one non-repeatable stage, but then the program manager would say, but we want to check the status again, again over time. But you have another 100 elements in the stage that, uh, what do you do? Maybe it's best to separate it into a different stage that can be repeatable and uh, that way allow for the next, you know, uh, adaptation. And, uh, maybe the data entry people will have to scroll and, and open that new form, but that will be the better uh, way into the, into the digital future. So very important is to make clear and uh, clear user manuals and documentations, uh, create flowcharts that will give the user the idea of what they have to do, cover the scenarios that you will, uh, that your program will cover. Uh, at, when you're designing, you have the chance to look into all these uh, scenarios because uh, it's not too late. You will have the usability testing. You will have the user testing as part of your design and it will come up, but just make sure you have it available to explain to the people. And the training, of course, has to be uh, provided here. Uh, <clears throat> so that design is a very crucial thing and that's why that slide with the, with the rocks uh, in balance but not in balance uh, at this stage I will ask uh, uh, Prosper from his Uganda to give some share some of his experience when looking into the design of the of the trackers thank you this is working yeah, thank you very much. If you can go to the next slide. So um, as HISP Uganda, we've been using BHIS to, uh, for over 10 years. And that started way back in 20, 2013. So if you can share the slide. Um, uh, most of the countries are going to be faced with a situation of uh, uh, disease surveillance, uh, especially the case notification, the immediate case notification. So in some countries, they will range from uh, uh, 10 to even 30 uh, case notification forms. And, uh, and so uh, when we did start in 2013, uh, we did a, a demonstration project with the CDC and Global Health Security. And uh, what we did is we're dealing with only three diseases. And so um, we, we started off by developing three programs, which worked very well because this was a short pro project and limited time. Uh, and so um, when this was very successful, by the way, very, very successful, uh, we now are moving into the scale. And this is now getting more notifiable diseases into the play. Uh, and so we are now faced with looking at 17 notifiable diseases. So the debate was, should we create 17 programs? Because each form, each case notification form is, is, is different from the other. It's just probably a few identifiers, you know, what's the number, what's the unique number and the name and the, the village where 
the case comes from. Uh, and so we were at the table and uh, and I think this is where we were, we were joined by the global team uh, and also the the other HISPs and I see Kara in, in, in the corner there. And uh, we had to sit on the table and try to come up with the nice design that would accommodate this. Uh, of course, straight away would go for 17 or so uh, uh, programs, but again, the maintenance and the support. And again, this is also against the preaching that uh, Yuri was talking about is you, we want to try to mimic the forms and imagine now the forms are so different. So um, first was to really try to see how we can be able to manage all this with one form. So for most of you who have used the the package, the case-based surveillance, it's all based on this. Uh, on this, and so for Uganda, we ended up by going for you know um, one health and beyond. And so you will see that uh, we've utilized the program rules a lot. Uh, and again, of course, it will also have a side effect in terms of the, the, the engine to run all these program rules. But uh, what you'll see is that we are beginning by trying to look at the different. Uh, 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 case areas, which is human, animal, and artificial disasters and natural disasters, so that all those forms can be accommodated here. And if you selected for human, then again, now you're now going into the human, and then you have all these diseases that uh, all the notification all, uh, that you need to be able to report on. And over here, the stages is one of the biggest challenging piece because this is where, uh, as you try to go disease by disease, then there are different um, uh, sections that you need to accommodate. So we were able to come up with standard sections and which would accommodate for the stages. And there you can be able to see that there is the investigation part of it. There is the lab request, there is the, the specimen testing and the follow-ups and um, admission, management and outcome. So what happens is that for every case notification form you look at, you must find where that element belongs in this uh, in this area. And so all the rules are controlled that when I choose anthrax, all the all the data elements in each of the sections we, and the stages will be able to show that. So this is what we have. And I think this has also informed on how many of the tracker programs are now being developed. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. <clears throat> And uh, I had an echoing example from uh, from his Rwanda, and uh, I know Adolfo he was not able to uh, come in. He shared with me that they had <clears throat> uh, for conditions for for cancer, they had more than hundreds of options that they had to work with, and in order to, uh, you know, they had the, to balance out the design and the and the performance because with uh, so many rules working in the background, it was slowing down the 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 process so they had to split uh those conditions into groups and reduce the number of of options in each group to make sure that it would work faster so the, the uh there are some examples from 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 this but <clears throat> let's look at uh at uh, at this point in, in in a few more details so uh with the digitizing health programs from paper okay so it's not just as we mentioned, it's not about converting paper registers into digital forms. So registers that we have, they help uh, they ensure that the efforts are aligned with the local needs. But the digital registers that's on the uh, on the right hand side, they, uh, they provide insights into practical and operational re realities of the of the health programs within the country. So. We need, of course, to address what are the outcomes of the health program and which approach would be used, what indicators are necessary to monitor, and how will this data be used at different levels, and that will guide us into designing the the the, the forms. And when we design the program itself, I think this is, for me at least, one of the most uh, important slides maybe in the in this presentation, and I think that. We need to work with re reverse engineering from outputs to data elements rather than 
the other way around. So my example about coffee at the beginning was, you know, I started where I started and I kind of built up and had to deal with what I had already started. But if you do, uh, if you design from the outputs, so you identify what you want to measure and monitor first, determine the outcomes and the outputs that are critical for the success of the program, then find out what data is necessary to be analyzed and at which levels. And then based on those outputs, you need to define the relevant indicators. Maybe they're already identified for you, then it's a little bit easier. So from the indicators, go back to the, go down to the data elements that will be used in the numerators and denominators so, uh, of these indicators. And then ensure that the data that you have collected is purposeful, purposeful and aligned with the with these outcomes, and then your required disaggregation will be the options in the option set, or will be the data elements depending on on the complexity of your of your tracker. And only then, once you have that, you can start. Uh, you have the building bricks of your metadata. <clears throat> I'll give you uh, an example here. Uh, with the package that we have published lately. And, uh, and this is uh, a TB household context investigation tracker. Uh, and what you see on the dark uh, screen is basically the, the flow chart of, of the program. And it's, the, the text is a bit tiny, but I, I will try my best to explain. But before I get into that, I will uh, talk about the data sets that you see there. So we had with uh, with uh, with our WHO counterpart identified these uh, elements or these data elements that were needed for the immediate analysis. And once we had that, we started thinking of how to design the the, the tracker for that. So and and these data elements, they, they, they were just a few of them, you know, how many people were identified, how many people uh, were screened, how many people were eligible to receive the treatment, how many started on treatment, and then the outcomes, how many completed and how many stopped. That's it. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, uh, we had a challenge to, to, to face because we were thinking of how to include that in our existing tracker for TB surveillance. Uh, because the, the context investigation is linked to the case surveillance of the of the uh, TB patients. So where we were thinking, should it be one of the part of the same tracker or should it be a separate tracker? Remember that Prosper was talking about their discussion and they decided to go for one program. Here we decided to go for, for a diff separate program. Why? Because we thought that it would be easier to uptake and still link with the existing tracker. So uh, once the case is identified and that you see that color uh, box there, uh, the household context would be recorded. And through the relationship, we can set up then the enroll the uh, person of the case in the tracker. And then we decided for uh, specific stages these are very simple, just a few data elements in each, but one for the registration, one for TPT, and one for the outcome. And here, and I, I'm I'm kind of jumping between these areas that we that I showed you at the beginning. We why we separated those because there were different considerations uh, in mind. Because once we set up the indicators uh, to pro program indicators to feed in those data sets here. We wanted to make sure that uh, here we will be dealing with a lot of people, um, a lot of tracked entity instances registered in the system. How should we optimize the performance of work? And you might know that when you work with the enrollment type of indicators, those queries are taking a long time. Well, when you're working with event indicators, things going a lot faster. So we split those uh, separated those stages to make sure that we could, uh, our indicators could be run 
faster uh, uh, than the enrollment type indicators because we needed to look into eligibility for TPT only from the TPT event and, and not get it from other uh, stages and so on and so forth. So <clears throat> try to make sure that the filters were grouped within one logical program stage and not separate, uh, spread out throughout the, the program and got to this, uh, to this design <clears throat> from the data set to the, to the tracker. And as we are starting to look more in depth into the tracker data model and elements and connections, uh, let's, uh, you know, let's have a deeper dive. So we, when we selected two programs, one for TBK surveillance, one for contacts, we knew that eventually uh, a contact might become positive and will be uh, a, in the, in a case. So how do we deal with that? How do, uh, with the track entity instance, with the enrollment? And so our, here I put the, two examples of how we dealt with the tracked entity attribute. So you can see that <clears throat> this is guidance. This is not prescribed. Th th things can change depending on your, on your needs. But if we started with a national ID as an identifier, uh, and it's the same for both. We reuse the same and tracked entity attribute, uh, similarly to last name and first name, uh, sex and so on. So we, <clears throat> Uh, uh, made sure that it would be easier to find that tracked entity instance in the system should they be enrolled uh, in in the other program. Uh, but then each of the programs had their specific uh, tracked entity attributes that were not part of the generic tracked entity type person. And here is another uh, you know, open question that is, or thing to consider is that we, when we design a tracker, we need to think about how, who are we, what is the entity we are tracking? Are we tracking a person? Are we tracking a case? Uh, because that will have a huge effect on how your program works. Uh, in some use cases, we know that uh, you want to track an individual over time, but then you know the DHS2 data model, what will happen once you assign, let's say, a, a TB registration number to your uh, to your person, in a few years' time, you know, God bless them, they will be uh, healed, but they will get sick again. They will get a new registration number. You know, DHS two data model. It's going to be difficult. You'll have to replace that. Uh, uh, TB registration number, or you will have to create a duplicate. Uh, tracked entity instance with the same name, with the same national ID. That consideration uh, should be also addressed when you design a program. Uh, and you should also guide your user into that, that, okay, maybe it's fine that they will find three people with the same name <clears throat> uh, because you will be counting the, the enrollments, not the, not the tracked entity instances, or it will. It is not good because you're looking at the individuals that your program is reaching, and then you cannot have that. You have to have that one individual uh, who is going to be unique, with no duplicates allowed. <clears throat> so that is that is very important. <clears throat> uh, once you pass the uh, attract entity attributes and the enrollment, uh, you'll be dealing with other things, right? So, okay, define your tracked entity. We covered that. Is it going to be person or case? Uh, what is the enrollment? Who? What are you enrolling? A case or person or whatever? Define it and explain it to to the users. Uh, what are going going to be your program stages uh, in the in the program and why? Uh, are you going to separate a stage because you want to limit access to it because you want the program to run? Uh, better and faster uh, or uh, will you be uh, making these stages available over time as the program progresses like here you have the 
diagnosis, you have the testing, you have the treatment, you have the outcomes and so on. And what will your events be? Will these events be repeatable? Will they be uh, just a one-off events? And then you will have your data elements. And when you use Trigger, use the, you know, all the possible uh, functions of the DHS to add the descriptions so that your user can see what exactly uh, is meant there, what they can they put uh, in the values and, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> uh, an example of uh, TVK surveillance here, uh, you see it's more complex than, than the previous program on the, uh, on the household contacts. We are playing with repeatable and non-repeatable stages to compile metadata in a way that will be, um, you know, easier to uh, use and adapt and scale scale up and extend. So uh, this is not the first version of the tracker, but when we when we created that, we had a simpler one that we had we uh, extended, where we split the diagnostic testing and monitoring tests to make sure that uh, you know, we could deal with both when, when we built in some uh, laboratory dashboards uh, where it was important to distinguish between these two. Uh, and then also making those monitoring lab stage available only after the person starts the, the treatment and not before that. Uh, we had made the program so generic that we could uh, and we put this into documentation that you could start enrolling a person in a facility from paper registers because they had they were already notified they had a registration number but you could actually enroll the person by entering the lab results in the stage and only later assigning the tb registration number which was the use case maybe a bit closer to the real time uh to uh, data entry <clears throat> uh, and he, as you can see here, we had repeatable stages, but I will show you another example. And again, it's the, the text, the small text is not so relevant. You will see it in the slides later if you need it. This is from the human rabies surveillance where we uh, deliberately had decided not to create a repeatable stage for each visit, but we knew that there will be only you know, in the country implementation, will be maximum five visits that you have. This is a short uh, enrollment that will last maybe for two weeks or more, seven days. So we created, you know, uh, non-repeatable stages for each event, but made it possible through the guidance to for the countries to adopt to adapt and say, okay, if they don't have five visits in their requirements in their policies, they can just remove that stage. But we use three, the same elements in each of the stages with clear uh, naming conventions to make sure that the, you know, the user will be, will find it easy to adapt. <clears throat> and uh, that has proved to be uh, successful so far in the, in, uh, through in the testing that we have uh, done with that. But as you see, each visit is somehow different from the other. So there's not always a um, one answer to to, uh, to to the same question, you know, yes, use repeatable stages or not. You have to think of the context. <clears throat> uh, and then when you get that far, you need to start looking at data quality. So um, again, make sure that your data elements that you use are, de are defined properly and then they're cons consistent throughout the program. If you can reuse them, reuse, uh, take advantage of using the ge generic library that also we provide from, from, from the uh, HISPOIO side that is available for us and it's getting updated. Uh, implement validation rules that, that will prevent errors and ensure data accuracy. But even here, <clears throat> and I will uh, 
I will show this some of your examples to you later. Uh, there cannot be a definite answer on what you need to do. So uh, make sure you are in control of the mandatory fields, uh, but don't uh, overdo it. Not every field has to be mandatory. Uh, and then uh, address the duplication of individual uh, records in data qual uh, quality. That's something that I've already covered. <clears throat> and yes, make sure that when you design a tracker that you uh, think about how uh, to audit and clean uh, the mess that is being created. Uh, for the data quality, we have uh, 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 Said, who uh, would like to say a, a few words about how they addressed the issue, and Said is from his uh, Ethiopia. Uh, I would like to say a few uh, points from our experience in uh, uh, tracker capture. Uh, Ethiopia uh, is very con uh, conscious when selecting to venture into tracker programs, and the biggest tracker program yet we have until now is COVID. Uh, the reason for this is because uh, there are fears that if we are still starting tracker program and if all the data is not captured, there may be disparity between the aggregate data reported upwards and the actual uh, data collected in the tracker. So if it's not complete, uh, we don't venture into that. So we had COVID, now currently we have the TB, DRTB tracker. But uh, during COVID implementation, some of the things we have seen, uh, the way you design the tracker program itself influences the data quality. Uh, first, we use the uh, toolkit, uh, the, the metadata toolkit released by UIO, and it was focus was uh, on registering every suspect, uh, but that's not viable. So it started creating problems. So what we uh, we have to modify, adapt and modify the design and started from sample collection only for uh, instead of uh, collecting data about every uh, person, we started collecting at uh, sample collection as well. But then one of the things that helped us uh, during design was uh, some of the things, people, instead of people uh, entering uh, data like numbers, for instance, if you are making it easier for them uh, to read using the camera, like if it's a barcode, if instead of entering the data, if they are reading using the camera, it, would, it, it was uh, re really helpful. And the way you render some of the option sets, uh, instead of putting them drop down, you can make it uh, like a radio button or checkbox. That was uh, helpful as well. And we had to uh, reduce some of uh, the, the, the forms. Some of them have a lo lots of questions. So we had to incorporate some program rules uh, to reduce them and to, uh, to you be useful as a decision support system as well. But uh, we have to make a balance between uh, making a decision support system and uh, uh, unnecessarily creating too many uh, program rules as well. Uh, the other uh, one was uh, maybe uh, there are some, uh, some standardized uh, way of uh, capturing some data, for instance, uh, but this, uh, they are uh, uniform whenever uh, across the world, even the WHO recommendation is if the birthday is not known, uh, putting another data saying this birthday is estimated. But uh, when it comes to actual practices within the countries, uh, people, uh, whenever they don't know the birthdays they venture into, into they, they would like to enter ages instead of uh, birthdays. Uh, so uh, we had it difficult uh, to introduce that. So we changed it to ages, but then, the first problem we uh, faced was people were entering uh, year of birth in the years field. So that created another problem. So we have to adapt and we have to put strict rules enforcing that if a person's age is more than hundreds, for instance, we are not, we are rejecting the data. Mm -hmm. So we had con we have to continuously adapt and make sure that the data quality is okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, could you brought up this uh, this d a dilemma with the age and. Uh, the day of birth, because there are use cases where putting the age might be just good enough uh, for a short programs. But when you're thinking of longitudinal tracking, then it's maybe not uh, the, the the best idea. Also see that the time is starting to push. So uh, 
uh, so there's a lot here, but with the with the uh, with the data quality, yes, in the testing phase, there there will definitely always be requests and changes to design and configuration. So uh, get ready for your dev instances to be messy, you know. But then in, in, engage the users, the data entry users, the analytics users from the start, uh, so that uh, the the faster you get the feedback. The, the better and the, the you know for, for you will maybe then go from what you call pilots to initial implementation faster than uh, and uh, the field testing you, you know uh, for for data quality should be uh, having ideally at subnational level and uh, <clears throat> it should be assessed before scaling up uh, test the performance uh, and then uh, that other part it does not belong here to this uh to this part but i just utilized the slide so i kept it there and, uh, anyway uh what are the what can be the examples of uh in tracker data quality uh you know checks uh if you look at one of the examples above uh this is an um values that are assigned by program rules uh, that will give the, the the user an overview of of the data that they're entering uh, without interrupting the uh, their uh, data entry and the data flow. So for example, based on the data that they've entered, uh, they there'll be some feedback uh, appearing in the in the data elements. It's one of the ways, or you can use a more conventional way of using the feedback widget uh, to give you, uh, reminders. Uh, you can have errors or warnings. Let's say there's a data in date inconsistency in one of the examples, and so you would not be able to proceed entering the data. But even this, you have to be very careful about because it takes you back to the question, is the data being entered real time, or are people using the registries or paper-based forms to enter the data? And what if the mistake is already on paper? Do you want the user to add, enter it and just notify them that there is some inconsistency and they need to check? Or do you want to be very strict and forbid to continue? And that may be a stopper in the program because if they they cannot change it or or because they would not be allowed to proceed if the if the program is very strict. So, but depending on where. Uh, where you you know what program you use, you have to make that de decision, and we try to uh, go for a soft approach. We inform the user that something is maybe wrong, uh, but they can pr maybe proceed if they uh, once they've read, once they are familiar with it. Unless it's a you know clearly lo uh, simple uh, logical error or validation error check uh, in the entering the name or and adding uh, letters where you should have numbers and so on and so forth. <clears throat> For real-time date entry, uh, we can, when you know, very few trackers I would say are used for real-time entry. And, but there are some theoretical workflows and some tools like this example from the, again, from the rabies surveillance that we, specifically designed to be able to handle uh, live or real-time data entry, giving unqualified uh, personnel some feedback messages that could guide them in the uh, decision-making to say, okay, uh, as long as there is no information on the test results from the animal, the assessment is pending, you should continue. But then if it's unknown, definitely continue. If it's if the tests are not available, for sure continue. But then, if the tests are available and uh, the the animal test result is a negative, okay, don't proceed with uh, animals. You can stop, but we don't close the program. They can still continue giving the, the vaccines and and register it. Or <clears throat> so. Uh, and this is uh, also uh, like specifically these kind of feedback messages were created so that people would be able to utilize them easy if they built custom apps based on that so they they could 
grab those outputs directly. <clears throat> so uh, another topic to address is the flexibility and scalability of uh, of trackers. So uh, as the and we've covered a little bit of that already. So it's some of it is just repeating uh, itself. So the data forms and workflows should be easily customizable so that you can meet the changing needs and requirements. Back to the example of TB, and that's what you said we're, we're saying. Uh, maybe today you're only enrolling the registered cases, but then you, this will change and you will be entering all the suspects as well. How can you design a tracker that will allow that? And, and so on. So implement modular design so you can easily update and change and add uh, new fun functionalities to your trackers without uh, interrupting the workflows. And then design the system to uh, be able to handle increasing amounts of data uh, and use it without decreasing in performance and plan for the future <clears throat> growth. So this is where another example uh we've in a lab stage in a tracker we said okay the users will be entering only the last uh positive or the last result that is successful but then if you have your tracker integrated with a lab system where all the data will be fed in maybe you want to remove that check and enter all tests that are applicable to that case uh, so you have to make sure that your tracker is ready for that. Uh, with data security and privacy. Uh, a very e clear example here is when I was working on the TB case surveillance tracker, we, we brought out uh, the HIV status of our patients on the top bar, making it large and bold to make sure that the clinicians can work with that. But then in real life, we thought, is this what we need? This is, we're dealing with very sensitive data here. And uh, uh, it's fine when that number of the HIV positive person gets into the aggregate data set where you just have unidentifiable ones, twos, zeros, but does it have to be on the, uh, on the top bar? Does it have to be shown in the card? Uh, and maybe we'll separate the HIV testing stage completely from the assessment and make it a separate so that only uh, certain people have access to that and can enter the uh, t t uh, test results. <clears throat> but then th this is the within program uh, privacy and security of, of, of data, the ethical aspects. But then there are also, uh, you know, you have to um, make sure that the, uh, you, you comply with the data protection regulations and then you know monitor your access control policies so to see who has access to what and then use role-based and group-based access uh, rather than individual uh, uh, user access to to your programs when you uh, work on on sharing <clears throat> Uh, when it comes to integration, and I'll be accelerating here a little bit uh, so we can finish on time. <clears throat> uh, when the, the good, uh, good example came from uh, Mohammed when he said, when you get a request for, yeah, we want to integrate this, make sure that you define what you need to integrate with. It's, if it's too generic, maybe it's not going to be worth it. It's going to be too expensive. It's not going to be needed. Who wants it and for what purpose? But then uh, when you work on the program, you make sure that it can be uh, integrated if you have a clear use case. For example, uh, the, with the laboratory information system and so on. Uh, maybe you will integrate it with the civil registry and pull data from, from, the, uh, from the civil registry system. So how would you do that, uh, consider that? <clears throat> and then when you, build the tracker, think that the, you, you might need to exchange this data with other systems and with other stakeholders. So think of how this can be addressed. Uh, I will ask Pamod uh, to make a few comments on their work with integration in uh, Sri Lanka <clears throat> before we move on to the next point.
Yeah. Uh, so I will make it quick. Uh, so when it comes to integration, uh, one challenge is like how to define integration. Like integration means what? Because it's always a two-way thing. It could be like we are just uh, pushing data from somewhere else to DHS2, or we may be extracting data from DHS2 to somewhere else. So for example, in Sri Lanka, what we did during the uh, COVID pandemic for uh, vaccine certificate generation, it was more about pushing data out of DHS2. But if I just stick to one current implementation, we are having a project called Diabetes Compass, where, uh, of course, fire is involved. So uh, we have a central data repository in the ministry, and we are just getting a fraction of data, which we have in Fire Server, into DHS2 uh, to create some dashboards. So then the thing is, like, we need to see, like, so we know, like, people will not be entering data in DHS2 tracker, right? So we can kind of get rid of some of the data elements uh, because we, and, and also the way we uh, design the layout, we can kind of uh, tailor it in such a way because we don't really care too much about the aesthetics because people are not really entering data. So that way we can decide like what are the minimal number of data elements that we need to include. And also uh, in Tracker, we kind of set up this program rules to ensure the data quality. So if we can ensure that the data quality is already assured uh, from the source, then we don't have to kind of configure all these things. So this is very important when you're planning the tracker. And the other thing, actually some challenge we are having, sometimes we do this, uh, we use program rules to do some calculations inside the capture environment and assign it into other data elements. So then a common challenge we are having is like when we don't do, I mean, when we don't open the capture app, how are we doing these calculations? So these, these things are some of the considerations uh, related to design perspective when we are doing these integrations. So just uh, sharing a very brief example. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Pamad. Yes, in, indeed, the, the, when you use, uh, you know, this kind of assigning of the, of the values to data elements in the entry point to make it easy for the users, but then you also want to use that assigned values in in calculations of indicators. You have to make sure that they these are being uh, the program rules are being triggered, even if the data comes from from the outside. And I think there are ways uh, to do that with the with the tracker endpoint. <clears throat> I'll skip a few slides here uh, on the question of the performance, <clears throat> and we are not talking just in general about the performance of the. Uh, of the instances of your uh, servers, but specifically, let's say program indicator performance optimization. So how, how can you work with that, with a lot of program indicators and make sure that, you've, uh, that your instances don't freeze and that your users uh, still can, uh, you know, enter data without delays? Uh, how do you set up your instances? Uh, when you plan the tracker, that's a question to address. But then also, how to you how to you optimize the, the the program indicators to make sure that your data exchanges work, uh, your scheduling works fine, uh, and how you monitor this process and uh, improve the performance even more after analysis. Here, I would like to uh, ask uh, Zubair uh, from his Pakistan and also. Uh, the member of the uh, his, uh, UIO to to comment on the on their endeavors with uh, program indicator performance in uh, in Pakistan. I think it's here. Hello, everyone. Yeah, so performance is something everyone try to get away from when it comes to tracker. So people who are using Tracker, they are aware of uh, performances, especially with the calculation of... Uh... You still, uh, can you hear me? Kale, you cannot hear me? Is, is it fine now? So yeah, yeah. I'm just making sure I don't reach to you so you don't put up questions. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Yeah, so yeah, performance is uh, something which we... we really have to be careful when using tracker, especially program indicator calculation. This is where we feel the most of the bottleneck. So uh, li a little bit of experience and then uh, some of the improvements that we are we have in to introduce in our 2.41, which uh, Pamod just mentioned that you need to open this capture app in order to make sure that assigned data element is there. But 
in 41 you don't need because that is already handled by our API endpoint. So you don't have to open capture app to make sure the assigned data values are there. You can easily do it using API endpoint. That's the improvement that we are expecting. And I think we have it in 41. Uh, for, for other performance, um, uh, very first step, uh, we have we had uh, initially uh, issues with performance because we had a limited server resource. It was uh, later on increased, and now we have uh, a very powerful server. But apart from all those physical resources, uh, in in our case, like we later found out that some of the indicators can be easily segregated, which are less needed. So again, that that is question: what you actually need so that you put up put the load considerably. That for the things that you actually need and uh, let the other stuff be handled later on. So for example, like we did some of the uh, dis disaggregations. Uh, for example, we needed TB07 quarterly basis, but we then uh, segregated some of the indicators for daily basis, which are needed more frequently. But beyond that, like whenever we found that the system is getting slow because of program indicators, and after some troubleshooting, we, we did find that for example, if you have 100 indicators, the out of 100, maybe five or six, which are the kind of black sheep, which are taking a lot of resources and the rest of the 80 or 85 are still performing okay. So this is what, these are the practices that you need to keep into and keep yourself intact with the server, which indicator is taking long time. You have to see whether it is, how much it is being used for. And if it is possible, you put it on a less frequent way so that you can avoid it running every day or every week. So a lot of practices that we have introduced uh, in our implementation and uh, like, for example, then uh, performance indicator, uh, program indicator, then we need uh, another uh, step, which is our tracker to aggregate, which is also need, dependent on program indicators. And I'm, I'm sure like in, in, uh, in our next, uh, few releases, we are also working on few things to have kind of um, inbuilt separate database for analytics so that it does not affect uh, the uh, data collection part and so that it it's it the server load will be divided into analytics and the data capture. So some of the things that I hope it, it can help you with, but most importantly, uh, figuring out what is needed frequently and which one, which indicator is taking most of the time, and then to decide the frequency of that indicator. Mm. And then, of course, if you're uh, setting up jobs for uh, running analytics, then running the data exchanges, then running some predictors in, in addition to that, that has to be considered and, and clearly defined so that you, you, you know what to do with it and how to address if that does not work. <clears throat> uh, I think we're gonna just keep the, the data analysis and reporting, uh, the slides are there. We need to make sure that, you know, the, the reporting tools uh, give you the meaningful insights for the data, but then uh, make sure that the requirements for the reporting come from the those that are interested in it. We have faced so many times, you know, we've given the dashboards to, uh, to, to projects that were not, not used, but then, their requirements were not matching with what was provided. And then uh, always track key performance indicators to, to assess the effectiveness of your program and then use that data uh, for decision-making and the adjustments within the program uh, itself. <clears throat> uh, usability testing we've uh, somehow covered uh, and then sustainability, I said it's a key concept, but we're not covering it. I'm leaving it th this slide here. Uh, and I think that this is it for me. It was good timing, but uh, I wish we had more for questions and comments. Um, I don't know, how do we deal with that? Would you, you can always reach out to me or find me in the hallway. Uh, I think the time is now out and we have to uh, make space for another audience but thank you very much for for the for your attention and hope this was a little bit meaningful to you uh <clears throat> i can now breathe <laughs> <laughs>